1950s science fiction podcast, season two, episode one. Movie review. This Island Earth. Hello everyone, I want to welcome you back to my podcast. It's been a long while since the last show, but now I'm trying to get back into the swing of things. I've been busy with other projects and taking time to examine the progress of the show. In the interim, I've read two novels, one science fiction, the other techno thriller. For the first time, I got invited to another podcast. I did a mini review of today's show topic as a guest contributor contributor for the Star Pog Log podcast. Star Pog Log is all about the publication of fan magazine Star Log, first published in the mid 70s and went out of print during the early 2000s. The podcast hosts Naylor and Carvara also discuss the Star Trek franchise and Gene Roddenberry in a similar podcast. You can follow them at Star Pog Log, Star Trek fans at Star Pog Log on Twitter and Star Pog Log and Star Pod Trek podcast on YouTube. I also want to mention science fiction author is Masro Acosta. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Who has been a great who has written a great science fiction novel about the future. I did a book review of his novel K3 Plus for my vocal media page. Be sure to check it out. Now on to the show. A Beam of Light This Island Earth premiered in New York City on June 10, 1955. Produced by Universal Studios as their first as their first science fiction movie shot in color. The film's producer was William Altland. The director was Joseph Newman with Jack Arnold as an uncredited assistant. The principal cast members were Rex Reason playing the part of Cal Meacham, Faith DeMorg playing Dr. Ruth Adams, and Jeff Morrow playing Exeter. The movie runtime is 86 minutes. This Island Earth, based on a novelization of the same name, written by Raymond F. Jones, published in 1953, appeared as three short stories in thrilling wonder stories. Universal International brought, bought the rights, and production soon followed. The movie begins with a cross-country flight by a jet fighter piloted by Cal Meacham. Meacham is a scientist who is returning from a conference held in Washington, D.C. Just before landing, his aircraft becomes frozen by a green beam of light. This beam of light shuts down the entire plane. However, the light beam lands the jet fighter safely on the ground. When his lab assistant states that he had seen what had happened, they both agree to stay silent. Both men believe the incident warrants further investigation and don't want to be ridiculed by anyone. The Interocitor One day while Meacham and his assistant are working in the lab, they receive a mysterious package. After opening it, the contents seem to be very strange. They are some type of electronic components that neither of them has seen before. With the parts, are instructions on how to put them together, and both men do just that. When the scientists complete a section, they order more material and continue the assembly. The two scientists finish the last portion of the device, then somehow it switches itself on and projects an image of a man. The person introduces himself as Exeter and congratulates both of them for the construction of the interocitor. Exeter Exeter explains the completion of the interocitor was a recruiting test for a project. An An opportunity for a scientist of his caliber 
should he decide to accept Ex Exeter's proposal. Meacham is intrigued by the offer. However, his assistant is uncertain about the offer. Meacham agrees to the proposal and Exeter tells him to be at the airfield tomorrow evening. At that point, the interrosser self-destructs in a small fire. The trip. The following evening, Meacham and his assistant go out to a local airfield. When they arrive, they find a pilotless airplane waiting for them. The passenger door opens and Meacham steps inside when told to do so. He discovers the plane is to be empty with only one seat in the passenger section. He sits down and the door closes shut amid the protest of his lab assistant. Who stays behind? The assistant is already very fearful of Exeter's motives and is suspicious. The plane takes off with Meacham aboard. It appears the aircraft is remote controlled or has an intelligence guiding it. The duration of the flight is not very long and Meacham finds himself in a rural area. When he, ex when he exits the plane, Dr. Ruth Adams, a scientist he once knew, welcomes him to the estate. She explains that he is now in the mountains of Georgia and, he will, and she will introduce him to everyone. The estate is an antebellum southern plantation that Exeter uses for his project. The Estate Dr. Adams transports Cal to the estate and upon arrival, meets Exeter in person. Exeter explains the purpose of his project to Meacham. Exeter states to Meacham that the mission of his undertaking is to end war itself, and the scientists of his caliber are needed. Cal accepts Exeter's explanation for the moment, but is concerned about the group of scientists working at the estate. He learns that all the scientists specialize in nuclear physics. He was also uneased by Exeter's assistant, Brack, played by Lance Fuller, who acts very sinister. Meacham befriends one of the scientists working on the project, Steve Carlton, played by Russell Johnson. He is best known as the professor of the TV series Gilligan's Island. Carlton and Ruth are also suspicious of Exeter's, mo Exeter's motives. The true purpose of the project. After spending some time at the estate, Meacham, Dr. Adams, and Carlton start comparing notes. Meacham becomes doubtful of any peaceful intentions Exeter has given him. The trio is equally curious about the odd appearance of Exeter and his staff. They all seem to have elongated foreheads, which is unusual for any human being. Meacham questions the nature of the project and asks the group about the activity going on in, in, in the nearby caves. All three scientists decide to leave, and Carlton gets killed in the escape attempt. Ruth and Cal press on and take off in a small plane parked in a nearby field. In the meantime, Exeter is discussing the project's progress with the supreme leader of his planet. As it turns out, Exeter and his entourage are aliens from another planet, thereby explaining the advanced technology and their appearance. So the Supreme Leader orders Exeter and Brack to destroy the estate, bringing the scientists to their home planet and subject them to mind control. Exeter objects to using mind control on the humans because he feels they would work better for their cause if their minds were free. Brack goes about the destruction plan while Exeter pleads his case to the Supreme Leader. Ruth and Cal are airborne in the small plane when the same green light appears again, and this time it drags the aircraft into the, an alien spaceship. The airplane lands itself inside a large hangar aboard the alien's ship, and both of them ex exit the plane. Shortly, they meet up with Exeter, and he explains the true purpose of the project. 
Exeter tells both Ruth and Cal that he is from another world outside Earth's solar system, and his home world is dying. His planet, Metaluna, is at war with another world, and the shield around his home world is weakening. Therefore, the need for nuclear scientists has become paramount to Metaluna's survival. Meacham and Adams are held captive aboard the ship and find themselves on their way to Metaluna. Metaluna Exeter takes Ruth and Cal to the main deck and prepares them for a long flight to Metaluna. They are required to stay inside a conditioning chamber so their system can adjust to heavier atmosphere of Metaluna. What's out, they witness an attack by the Zygons while in transit. Exeter explains the Zygons have rejected all attempts of making peace with Metaluna. The war itself has been endless. Later, the ship arrives at Metaluna and we see a bleak world consumed by constant warfare from the Zygons. Meacham and Dr. Adams go before the Monitor, who is the supreme leader of the planet. The Monitor has absolute power. He gives the scientists a choice of either either cooperate or face lumbotomy. Exeter objects to the use of force and argues with the Monitor. Then there's an attack by the Zygons, which causes some disruptions, thus allowing the group to escape. Escaping the Planet When some of the parts of the ceiling fall away in the Monitor's room, the trio makes a quick exit and Exeter takes them back to the Metaluna spaceship. All three get in, into the spacecraft, but they are not, not all out of danger yet. A mutant is stored away on the ship and attacks Ruth, but she manages to escape unharmed. The mutant is a large eye creature with a head that looks like an exposed brain and claws or hands. He is the only time you see a bug-eyed monster in the entire movie. The group manages to make it in time before the last Zygon attack destroys Metaluna. After witnessing the destruction, it appears that Exeter may be the last of its kind. The ship heads back to Earth, and Ruth and Cal leave the Metaluna ship by the way they came. Exeter stays inside the spaceship and crashes it into the ocean. My thoughts. I've seen this movie at least two or three times over the years. It's a great story and it's more of a thinking person's movie than an action thriller. The movie, the motion picture is almost devoid of any bug-eyed monsters except for the mutant. Most sci-fi movies of the period featured plenty of monsters, aliens, or mutated creatures. They were cheap and easy to produce on low budgets. However, this island Earth was an exception. This movie had a much larger budget and was shot in color and had an intelligent script. It was, it was like the Star Wars of its day. The producers made good use of some special effects that would influence future filmmakers. They used miniature models, elaborate sets, and color photography in unique ways. The, photogra the photographers used deep rich color for for the light beam effects in some scenes. Also, the same process was used again in different parts of the movie. This Island Earth is definitely on the A-list of science fiction movies of the 50s. It's a must-see for any 50s sci-fi fan. It rates as great as Destination Moon and Forbidden Planet. If you're interested in watching this movie, you can find it on YouTube. More recently, a contributor, contributor for Galactic Journey blog wrote a great review of it. Follow Galactic Journey on Twitter at Journey Galactic. I will also have the movie trailer on my vocal media page, so don't forget to take a look at it. All you need to do is click on the website logo on your podcast platform and the profile will come up. Once again, thanks for taking the time to listen to my podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it.